Uh, welcome to the session on, um, on pain for cures. My name is Colleen Rye. I'm Director of Policy at Faster Cures uh, Center of the Milken Institute. And we're so grateful that you're here with us today um, to talk about what we think is an incredibly important topic on how do we pay for the coming wave of curative therapies. You know, cure is a word that we don't get to use that often in healthcare. Uh, most treatments alleviate symptoms or treat symptoms, and yet cures are here today. In 2017, we had three FDA-approved therapies. There have been many more in the European context, and we know that there's many more to come. Patients are benefiting in phenomenal ways. Blindness is going away. Cancer is being resolved. And yet these therapies are very, very expensive. $373,000 to $850,000 last year. That's before you go into hospital and other ancillary and associated costs. So very expensive therapies that are helping patients, and many more on the way. Uh, we know from ICER there's over 500 gene therapies in the pipeline. Uh, approximately 20 of those are in advanced uh, stage three development. If you can apply historical success probabilities, which is something we may discuss, but if you can, um, that means that within two to three years' time, we could have an additional 12 to 14 gene therapies, curative, durable therapies, uh, on the market uh, in the United States. So where does that leave us? Well, first of all, it leaves us with patients in a much better place with hope, with therapies that we couldn't have dreamed of um, really even five to 10 years ago. Um, but it leaves us with some potential access issues. And at $1 million of treatment with 14 more on the way in the next two to three years, that could set up our financial system uh, within healthcare um, for, uh, for some difficult times without some innovative financial strategies. So really the fundamental question that we'd like to talk through today with the panel is how do you ensure access for patients to these curative and potentially transformative therapies while also rewarding manufacturers appropriately for their investment in this space? And so for that, I'd like to turn uh, to the panel, have everyone uh, first introduce themselves. Cindy, if you could start. Sure, sure. Uh, good afternoon, all. My name is Cindy Verst, and I uh, am the president of R&D Research and Design Delivery Innovation Unit uh, with IQVIA. Hi, I'm Mark Trusheim, Strategic Director at the MIT New Digs uh, Program, where I also help lead our Financing of Cures in the U.S. project. Uh, Joe Labarge, I'm the Chief Legal Officer of Spark Therapeutics, where I receive legal, government affairs, and public policy. I'm uh, Lou Di, good morning. I'm Lou Di Gennaro, uh, the uh, President and CEO of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Okay. I'm Chris Barden. I, uh, run, I'm a partner at MPM Capital, and I run one of the world's largest oncology dedicated investment funds called the UBS Oncology Impact Fund. Thanks for having us. Oh, wonderful. We're, so, we're glad that everyone's here. Um, so just to kick off the discussion, I, you know, we're going to have some opening comments about where everyone sits um, at, the, at the nexus of access and, and reimbursement. And, and Joe, I'm hoping you can help sure. us first to help set that context for, uh, for what you're doing at Spark Therapeutics uh, and some of your, uh, your pricing strategies. Sure. So um, at Spark, we were, um, as Colleen mentioned, one of the approvals last year with our uh, drug Luxterna, which is form for a form of inherited blindness. Um, we had an interesting you know, challenge as we marched towards uh, approval and uh, ultimately setting the price in that this was the first pharmacologic treatment for any form of inherited retinal disease. So just to set the stage, these are patients um, who have an irrever irreversible form of blindness. They um, see their physician. Um, they are, if they are lucky, they're genetically diagnosed and told exactly what type of inherited retinal disease they have. Many of them today still don't get that genetic diagnosis. But then they're told they're going to go blind. Um, and they can come back and, and be checked up on periodically. But there are no other, other treatments for any form of inherited retinal disease until Luxterna. So with that backdrop, as we thought about pricing, we really needed to look at it from a slightly different lens in terms of how do you, how do you set the, the value for what that therapy is? What is the value for restoring uh, sight to a child who is otherwise going to be legally blind? Um, and you, we didn't have cost offsets to really be looking at in, in the health system. These aren't, there aren't other drugs that they're taking that you're replacing. So it was really about looking at 
you know, what's the cost of educating a blind child versus a sighted child? What are the economic um, impacts of that blind child on society in terms of productivity? What are the costs associated with a, a caregiver having to give up, a, uh, give up work or not pursue a career that they otherwise might have because they have to care for a blind child? And we looked at a, a lot of those, those factors, and we also looked at other things that you wouldn't traditionally look at just in terms of kind of making sure that we were, um, you know, in looking at, at all possibilities. And we, we looked at actually jury awards and, and whether or not what, what a, a jury would um, place, that, what value that jury would place on someone who goes blind. Clearly, those are different circumstances or typically a more traumatic event, but we tr took a step back and said, okay, putting aside whether there are punitive damages, right? What, what are the compensatory damages associated or what do we, how does society view uh, the value of sight and vision? So those were the things that, that we really looked at as we, we sought to set a price. I mean, when we did our analysis, we, we believed that the value of uh, vision, when you take all of those factors into place, was well in excess of a million, a million dollars. Um, and we, we ultimately ended up pricing at $425,000 per eye or, you know, $850,000 a patient. Um, we then, you know, took that price and, and rather than, uh, and recognizing that it, it is high, tried to figure out ways in which we could, one, ensure access for patients, uh, two, ensure that the healthcare system could, could um, uh, sustain that. And we're doing that with a view toward the longer a little longer term, and as you indicated, the number of different gene therapies that are in the pipeline, right? This is, this is a problem where we have potentially curative therapies and a uh, payment system in the United States that's not set up for cures. It's set up for a fee-for-service. It's set up for paying for chronic administration of drugs. Um, so those are, you know, some of the things, and if we can get into the details of the specific things that we set up now or, or later, I'll leave enough room for others to provide introductory <laughs> remarks as well. <laughs> We do want to hear about those later because okay. it's really, really fascinating what you've done at Spark. Um, I do want to pick up a thread of, of what you talked about in terms mm -hmm. of setting the price. There's also the cost dimension. And, and Chris, I'm, I'm hoping that you can help us unpack some of the cost dimension for some of these gene and cell-based therapies. Yeah, so I think I'm here with the investor perspective because really these companies, mm -hmm. what we have to remember is need to be financed from inception to the market and then beyond. And that takes sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars. I'd be curious at some point to hear what the spark cost to get to that finish line was. And so the question really has to balance what is the cost to patients, but and also what has been invested. Because at the end of the day, given that we have a capitalist economy, if we don't allow our companies to earn a sufficient profit, they won't develop drugs in these indications. And in fact, that was why the Orphan Drug Act was actually put into place, to decrease some of the cost and hurdles for getting these drugs to the marketplace. So some of the things that the Orphan Drug Act, for example, put into place were one, um, co uh, basically uh, uh, cost, uh, cost assistance, so with regard to grants and things that would lower the cost to the company in developing the drug, and also shortening the regulatory process. So for example, enabling companies to get through quickly in terms of the regulatory process rather than the traditional 14 months or so, changing the regulatory burden, changing the ability to interact with regulators. All of these things add to time and cost of capital for our companies. And basically what we need to do is make sure that we shrink that to as much as possible so that the risk and the reward are there for the company at the end of the day. And thank you very much. And uh, Cindy, turning to you now, I know that um, you know, we've talked quite a bit about collaboration and some of the changes in that and how that might affect the cost structure. Um, is that something that you can help us um, think about here today? Sure, sure. So um, as mentioned earlier, you know, gene therapy in the clinical development thereof, it's very complicated. You know, there are, at the end of 2017, over 950 ongoing uh, gene therapy, cell uh, therapy trials around the globe. About half of those, 50, 52 percent in the U.S., about 28 to 30 percent in Europe, um, Asia Pact, 12 to, to 15 percent in the rest, rest of the world. Um, gene therapy, cell therapy, in and of itself, uh, produces such incredible uh, complications and strains on the R&D process. Uh, for instance, protocols are very complex. Uh, associated with uh, amendments along the way, uh, pr promoting incremental cost of, on average, $500,000 three-month delay uh, along the way. 
Um, the, the saturation of clinical trials around the globe is putting hardships on investigators, uh, for instance. The, these investigators have to be accredited, trained, very complicated procedures uh, uh, in terms of how the uh, research and development is actually conducted. And that's, of course, notwithstanding uh, the manufacturing of the investigational product itself, be it, you know, um, more in terms of uh, if it's the patient's own cells uh, or if it's derived um, in a, a much more uh, population health-like approach. So these complexities, of course, adds to that cost and that burden. And even from a patient-centric point of view, uh, how to find the right patients to be treated by the right investigators at the right, if you will, facilities adds time and burden along the way. So some of the, the approaches that we're taking um, within my institution of IQVIA is how do we leverage real world evidence, analytics, advanced analytics, machine learning, and really helping our sponsors get to these right patient populations that are being treated by the right uh, facilities and investigators. And of course, all along the way uh, with an eye towards speed uh, in getting uh, these products through that clearance and mm -hmm. out uh, into, the, uh, into the mainstream and having access to the products. So hopefully that gave a little wonderful. purview. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, and, and Mark, I'm gonna, gonna turn to you now. Um, and so we've, we, we've gone through, we've had innovative collaboration approaches to developing the drugs and we thought about pricing. Um, you know, what's, what, what's kind of your, your, your 50,000 foot overview of some of the reimbursement uh, innovative financing mechanisms out there? Great, thank you. So our financing of cures project uh, simply begins with the assumption that all the debates around what the right valuation should be, the value setting, has been resolved. And we believe it's going to be expensive, right? It might be less expensive or more expensive, but it's going to be expensive. Uh, so then what? All right? And that's where we get into uh, hosting a consortium of about 50 organizations from payers to patient advocacy groups to uh, innovators and developers uh, uh, such, as, such as Joe's firm and intermediaries as well to address this challenge. And if I could see slide three, uh, you've heard the number of 12, 900, remember? Our MIT statistical modeling of the pipeline would suggest mm -hmm. that we'll have about 40 <laughs> cures by 2022. We'll call them durable therapies. Cure is such a loaded term, right? And those, the challenge, mm -hmm. as the bar show, is that the classic drugs in the bottom charts, you pay for them as you go. But with these durable therapies, you condense all that benefit and value up until the very first payment through this. And that exacerbates three really unique financing challenges of certainly the payment timing. It suggests things like mortgages. We'll call them performance-based annuities through all this. But it also suggests uh, with these products, we don't really understand their performance yet. So there's an uncertainty about will they be effective in a broader population and for how long? Three years, five years, a lifetime? We just don't know yet. And then there's the actuarial risk. If you're a self-insured employer of 100,000 lives, are you getting no blind children this year or this quarter? Or do you get four? And if you get four, that can be quarter uh, $800,000 per, per child, two and a half million dollars for the year. If you're a small insurer plan, that could be a big chunk of your net income for all that. So those are the, the, the challenges. And there's a variety of financial engineering tools we use across many other industries that don't come yet to healthcare. And we think there's phenomenal opportunity, but it has to be adapted and customized for each of these situations because cures are not the same. So Valdi with millions of patients looks very different than, than Joe's product. Hemophilia with big cost offsets is different. Payers are different, self-insured employers versus Medicaid. Um, and the patient preferences themselves are, are very different. So we have that sense of precision financing that adjusts and understands these three financing challenges in the context of the disease, the provider setting, the way the modality, is it a transplant or an injection, 
going forward. Those are the opportunities. We have a chance later after Joe talks about his. We'll see maybe how there's some generalizable uh, approaches that come out of all this. But these are the three big challenges, which are different than classic pharmaceuticals, and you need precision financing for each of the various niches and cures for this to really work. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to now turn to uh, turn to Lou. And you um, can probably take down that slide. As Lou's oh. Unless Lou would like to explain it better uh, <laughs> and, and tell me where I got it wrong. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't so, dare try to do that, but I will ask you to pull up slide eight, please. Yeah. So, so it's not on that slide, but I have seen other slides, Mark, uh, where MIT estimates show that about half the pipeline is oncology related. Yes, so about half of the durable therapy pipeline, as we call it, because mm -hmm. don't really cure cancer in quite right. the same way. Mm -hmm. But this durable therapy concept, about half the pipeline we think is in oncology. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a big market. It is. Um, and there's a lot of patients. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about the patient perspective um, in, in this whole conversation? Yeah. Happy to, um, I, and, and as, a, as an unapologetically patient's first organization, um, I thought I would take it, be, begin and, and talk about a, a, a patient example. So the picture here, um, the, the woman in the center is Emily Doomler. Emily, as you can see, is a, a wife and a mother. Uh, she lives in, outside of Kansas City. Uh, about three, four years ago, Emily was, at, at the age of 32, was diagnosed with an aggressive form of lymphoma. Uh, she spent the better part of two years in, ho in the hospital setting receiving increasing, increasingly aggressive forms of chemotherapy only to hear um, after two years of treatment that she had uh, less than six months to live. Uh, Emily fortunately became patient number three on a clinical trial uh, sponsored by the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society with a company called Kite Pharmaceuticals to test chi chimeric antigen receptor T-cell immunotherapy in aggressive lymphoma. Um, this is a picture of Emily two years out of treatment. She's been cancer-free, a durable, to, to date, a durable remission. Uh, there, there's no doubt that she would have succumbed to her disease. The physicians had exhausted every other treatment. Um, so Emily, I, I put this up here so to, to personalize and give you a patient perspective here. Emily is emblematic of a group of patients who are really at the intersection of these cutting edge technologies. L let's talk about, because the audiences tend to be mixed, let's talk a little bit about CAR T therapy. If you've been in any of the sessions that uh, Frida Lewis Hall, the, uh, the chief medical officer at Pfizer was in, you've heard her say Star Wars medicine. <laughs> well, yeah. CAR T therapy, I would posit to you, is Star Wars, Star Wars medicine. medicine. We, we've been able to repurpose a deadly disease virus, the AIDS virus, and turn it into a tool for doing good. So today, physicians use a crippled version of the AIDS virus that can't cause disease any longer to reprogram the patient's own immune system so their own immu immune system finds and attacks and eliminates the cancer. It, it's Star Wars medicine. Um, so, so Emily and other patients like this are at, at this, the intersection between this amazing innovative technology and our ability, or, or as Mark might can say, our lack of ability to figure out how to pay for it. Um, the therapy that Emily had was subsequently approved by the Food and Drug Administration last year and currently has a $375,000 price tag. Um, when you factor in the additional hospital stay and, and other ancillary care that a patient like this needs, the price tag is upwards of a million dollars. And uh, I, I, for one, for, for, from where I sit, don't want to inhibit the creativity and the innovation going on in the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry because patients like Emily need therapies. Um, uh, but on the same, uh, in, in the same way, in the, in the, we, we have to think about how we're going to meet the cost burden for these diseases and make them, these uh, treatments, and make them accessible to patients across the board. I mean, one thing I was just going to bring up to explain why, for example, some of these therapies are so expensive, and really because traditional drugs are small molecule drugs, they're easily manufactured. The cost of goods relative to the price of the drug is somewhere on the order of 2%, 3%, 4%. But some of these higher priced, they're high complex therapies, such as gene therapy, such as cell therapy, such as these complex biologics, they're exceedingly difficult to manufacture. 
let's take CAR T cells. You need to take the cells from a patient, transfer them to a manufacturing facility, transfect them with a virus, which has been specially created for the purpose of transfecting that cell, to give it the genes to fight the tumor cells. Then you need to grow it up, manipulate them, process them, again, all under <coughs> sterile GMP facilities, and then give it back to the patient. This is personalized cancer therapy, really kind of at its utmost. It's extremely complex. You know, people actually have been speculating about this price of CAR T manufacturing, and of course Novartis and the others have not told us how much it costs. But there is speculation that the uh, Novartis cell therapy is costing more to manufacture than it costs than they're receiving for each patient. So really, it's an extremely complex process, and maybe you could speak about the price of gene therapy manufacturing, mm -hmm. which um, is also very complicated. So then the issue is, is, well, how can we drive this cost down? And so actually, one of the things we need to do is improve the technology in this situation. So you know, as our technology improves, as we develop other modalities of cell therapy, such as allogeneic, where you can take it straight off the shelf and not need to process an individual patient's cells, you know, you could potentially drive down the cost of a single therapy, which is currently on the order of $400,000, and drive it down to $40,000. So in that situation, maybe we might dramatically change the kind of the risk-reward ratio in terms of pricing. You know, Lou, I've, I've heard you say that we need adult conversation around cost. <laughs> and, um, and I really love that phraseology, uh -huh. and, uh, and, and I know that you put out a position paper. Can you speak to yes. that? Yes, yeah, happy to. Um, so I, I want to be careful here. Um, I, th I think we need to have a conversation around not just the cost of drugs or the cost of the therapy, but a, a, a c the cost of care. And, yes. um, you know, right. my focus is cancer, so the cost of cancer care, the, the cost burden, that the, the patient actually uh, uh, receives in, in, in the course of their treatment, uh, it's not just the cost of drugs. And that's and, for sure. you know, These for are very to complex to administer as well as to treat the side effects. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, really today the, the cost of drugs for the typical blood cancer patient is perhaps 15% of the total cost of their care. So we need to look at the whole system, the, mm -hmm. the provider, the hospital stay, diagnostics, um, uh, the, the pharmacies, the pharmacy benefits managers, the pharmaceutical companies and biotechnology companies, um, all the players in the continuum of providing care to patients. Um, I think we need to have an, we need to bring those folks together and have an adult conversation around the value that each one of those players adds to the system for the patient, yes. the value for mm -hmm. the patient, and the cost that they're extracting, the dollars, the expenses they're extracting from the system. I think if we can do that, because part of the problem in this is there's, there isn't any transparency. You mentioned it. We don't know what CAR-T costs to manufacture. Um, we really don't have any transparency around what the true costs are. And without that transparency, it's hard to understand where the savings might accrue. So uh, I, the, the policy statement that we issued about a year ago now and the policy objectives that we have are literally focused on bringing the players in that continuum together. Um, asking them to have an adult conversation, bring transparency to where the costs really are, and then begin to look at where savings might occur, occur and also um, to bring some reality to the, the um, dollars that are being extracted by the different entities with respect to the value that they're actually adding to the mm -hmm. system. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, and Joe, I know sure. that um, some of your payment approaches yep. have, um, yeah, I will not ask you the cost of your gene therapy, but, right. <laughs> um, but I know some of your payment approaches have addressed some of the value chain sure. issues, and, yeah. and um, can, can you help us with that today? Sure. So, um, yeah, I, I highlighted some of the challenges of kind of setting the price for this, for this disease. One, one of the benefits was this is an ultra-orphan um, indication. We estimate that there are 1,000 to 2,000 you know, patients with this disease in the United States and 10 to 20 patients kind of a year. So that actually provided us um, the opportunity to think creatively for you know, the first time kind of out of the box gene therapy for a genetic disease in the United States and, and coming at the, the, this pricing question with some new approaches. So we, we've, we've structured a couple th things with, um, currently that we're working on. One was to actually, actually provide um, uh, efficacy and durability measures for our, for our drug. So um, we, um, we are testing uh, patients 30 to 90 days after, after treatment to ensure that what they, they actually got an um, 
efficacy, that they, the, the, the drug actually worked. And then we're looking um, 30 to 36 months after treatment to see whether or not um, they still have that effect, right? So the idea of our therapy is it's, again, a once and done and not a chronic treatment. We want to make sure that the value that we're delivering extends for a period of time. And we've structured actual outcomes with uh, looking at that 30 to 36 months after um, therapy. And what we've structured under the current kind of regulatory um, and payment requirements is a discount or a rebate back to the, to the payer if either of, or both of those fail. That's, that's one thing that we've put in place. Um, the other is an innovative contracting model where, you know, under the traditional, um, the tra the traditional co commercial model, we would sell our product to a hospital. The hospital, um, in many circumstances, is actually able to buy that drug from us at a 23.1% discount. And then that hospital system able actually uh, marks that drug up and sells it to the payer. Um, so two things. One, that puts the hospital in a difficult situation of actually taking balance sheet risk of buying in a high-cost a high drug. And two, inc potentially increases cost to the system by allowing that hospital system to mark the drug up and what they're selling to the payer. So what we did was actually structure arrangements where we are actually selling the drug directly to the payer, either directly to the payer or through a specialty pharmacy. And what that does is, one, it takes the balance sheet risk you know, off the table for the hospital system. It ensures that the payer knows what the cost of that drug is. And then we're actually able to ensure um, on the access side that patients are getting, getting access to the drug and aren't getting um, hit with high copays or other, um, other impediments to being treated. So we ensure that there's a fast kind of pre-authorization process, right, that they're not waiting around for a long time to be treated. And we're ensuring that they're being treated with, uh, or, or they're being charged uh, in network rates, which as a company, we're actually looking to, to cover for those patients as well, so that those patients aren't out of pocket, you know, significant costs associated with, um, with our drug. Now the, the third element um, that we're still in the process of working on that I think really is the opportunity to set the stage for other, other gene therapies and, uh, and indications like hemophilia or others is we're working with, with CMS and HHS around a demo program that would enable actual installment payments as opposed to all upfront and then a rebate model um, and in actually being able to tie deeper discounts for uh, kind of non-performance of the drug either in the installment or the rebate context. And I think that really sets the stage for uh, enabling you know high cost therapies and, and the chart that you put up right trying sure. to spread that cost out from all being up front and being in some cases a real uh, burden to the to the healthcare system especially when you think about some of the smaller self-employed plans mm -hmm. some of the Medicaid plans being able to sh spread those costs out over numerous years and matching that up with really the durability of, of the therapy when I think durability is such a crucial issue here, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, because you know of necessity, many of these are um, are novel uh, novel endpoints, novel designs, small sample sizes, short times, which works for FDA um, uh, approvals. But I'm gonna look to to Cindy here on. You know, is, is there a role for real-world evidence to help mitigate some of those concerns um, and develop these financing approaches? Yeah, indeed. Um, one of the regulatory uh, requirements for gene therapy, cell therapy, is long-term evaluation. Um, not only, of course, assessing durability, but long-term safety, mm -hmm. especially, for instance, like CAR-T, where you know, there could be some immunogenicity long-term impact. So um, actually up to uh, durations of following these patients up to 15 years uh, as a part of the post-marketing commitments and upward to 1,000 to 1,500 patients required in that assessment. As you can imagine, um, sponsors enduring the, the cost of the actual development and then post authorization having that burden and we do think that real world evidence can play a large role here in being able to follow these patients longitudinally in assessing eff eff efficacy mm -hmm. uh, durability as well as long-term safety <laughs> trying to uh, curtail some of the costs associated so real world evidence what I mean by that is actually being able to follow uh, patients within EMR settings um, with, you know, uh, of course, any additional primary data collection that's not already contained within that system. 
and whereby reducing uh, cost along the way. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, you know, Mark, so you know, I'm hearing of outcomes and rebates, and, and I'm, I'm, my contracting mind is, is going round and round. And, and, and um, can you explain some of, the, um, some of the policy barriers and some of the administrative and operational uh, challenges that might arise? Oh, well, you've already heard Joe describe yeah. a, a couple, right, that the current Medicaid best price rules and mechanics get in the way. Those were rules set up presuming you were selling cholesterol-lowering drugs where you took a pill every day and you got a month's supply at a time. So the way they measure what's the current market price for which Medicaid should get a discount is by every quarter looking at what were the costs and what were the actual transactions uh, that, that were measured during that quarter. But these are multi-year contracts where you may not know for three, four, five years what the ultimate price was. Does Medicaid then get a rebate that's in addition to the rebates that were in there? How do you calculate that? Because you don't like treat everybody on January and then wait, it's a rolling uh, population all the time. So there's just huge mechanical and fairness challenges of how do you take that round hole system and put this square peg of creativity into it mm -hmm. is a real challenge. And, uh, you're in those challenging negotiations yeah. now, I guess you've, 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 you've stated. So that's one. But there's also several other real challenging rules. You wouldn't think it, but FASB and accounting is a challenge for these. So if you're in uh, an insurer and you enter into one of these long-term payment contracts, the rules for recognizing your medical loss, your medical loss ratio sorts of numbers, are if you know it's a certain payment, even though it's out for three, four, five years, you have to book the entire amount in the same year of the treatment. So if you're trying to manage your income statement, it doesn't help you, okay? And that's the main reason. They usually have told us, as members in our Focus Consortium, that they've got lots of cash on the balance sheet because of all their reserves that they have to carry. Cash is not their challenge. Managing the income statement hit of these new durable therapies in those first couple years when you have a backlog of patients that need it, that's what they have to try to smooth out. But their FASB insurance accounting rules mean unless they somehow put a lot of risk on the table and variability, they won't be able to do it which is a great opportunity for those of you in the investment community here to play that middle arbitrage role, role right? Because mm -hmm. you could convert that into a fixed capitated payment back into those insurers so they get to do it month by month, year by year doing it. You take some of the, the risks and the opportunities and it sounds strange, but it's being driven as much by the accounting rules as it is by the Medicaid and the regulatory challenges. And then there's the data collection. Cynthia said. What do you do when patients move from plan to plan? Right? This patient mobility issue. So you treat them under plan A and then they move across the country and go to a different plan out here in California. Okay? How do you share the data? Particularly if they're durable cures, they're not going back to the doctor all the time for checkups. Right? You have to somehow get the patient engaged and involved that they're willing to have the 36 month follow up even though they think they're seeing pretty well right now, why do I need to go back? Now, in this particular therapy, that may be a bad example because I'll probably go back to the ophthalmologist pretty r routinely, but other of these durable therapies, not the case. So those are just three or four, patient mobility, the accounting rules, the Medicaid best price, uh, those are three of the biggest ones we're trying to work through and you can't solve just one without solving all three simultaneously or you don't get something that works, which is why this is not just a two-way negotiation. It has to be a, co a community negotiation. By the way, I was going to say pricing is also not a static concept, and I'm going to bring up the example of hepatitis C, which is another cure. So our company was a Series A investor in Pharmacet, which developed Sovalvi and Harvoni, which cure hepatitis C, whereas the alternative would have been to develop cirrhosis, hepatocellular liver cancer, need a <coughs> transplant and ultimately die of your disease. So, you know, it came out with a price initially at launch, which created, I would say, a lot of economic burden for our system because there are so many patients with hepatitis C. And the value was very well justified if you consider what the alternative for treating your hepatitis C was. And so we had a discussion, and actually over time that price came down. Why did it come down? 
one, regular old market forces. Competition came in. Mm -hmm. um, we basically had two or three competitors join the field, given that the market was lucrative and exciting for people to enter. Mm -hmm. So good old capitalism played its hand, and multiple competitors came in. That changed the dynamic. The other thing as well is that actually people were negotiating with the companies. And so actually the original price of treatment, actually mm -hmm. negotiating discounts kind of went up to now. I think the discounting is over 50%. Again, I'm not quite sure because those numbers are never fully released. But discounting, negotiation, again, capitalist forces. The third thing was actually technology. So it turns out that initially we started treating patients with 12 weeks of therapy. But then as we did more research and more clinical trials, we figured out that eight weeks of therapy might be sufficient. So then the price of therapy actually shrunk automatically by that 30%. So, you know, all of these things. So now we have to throw in changing prices as well and all these other dynamics. So trying to build that model that you described sounds really hard. <laughs> <laughs> Which is an actuary's and investor's oh, dream, dear. right? Oh, because dear. there are opportunities there. So this is why the Milken um, event here is so exciting to try to bring mm -hmm. more of this investor knowledge and skill into solving these challenges because those aren't skill sets that the companies you invest in generally have. They don't normally have an actuary on staff. We need an MIT professor to do that for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want someone who actually knows what they're doing. <laughs> Colleen, I wanted to pick up on yeah. something that actually has been mentioned at, at both ends of the panel here, and that is improving technology over time. And, Absolutely. and particularly what Cindy mm -hmm. said about the costs inherent in, uh, in the clinical development of these, of these agents, and because they're okay. substantial. If we could have an impact there, mm -hmm. uh, I think we could make an, an, an advance in term, right out of the box in terms of what these therapies might cost and maybe leapfrog the, the, the technology. Absolutely. Um, uh, we, we have a, a clinical trial underway in, um, in acute myeloid leukemia, uh, which in, invokes <laughs> preci a precision medicine approach mm -hmm. uh, to treating newly diagnosed patients with AML. It's currently testing nine drugs simultaneously. And, and I, I bring it up simply to say that in the course of our standing this trial up and now having run it for about a year and a half, we're, we're, we've, been able to, um, we've been able to realize about a 25 to 30 percent discount on the cost of the standard industry trial. Wow. Um, with wow. what, what I think will still be, and, and that's before you ask me how, um, <laughs> just bringing some new technology to bear. You know, I think we, we've taken a if Amazon were to get into clinical <laughs> development, right? New technology, faster, less expensive, perhaps they would recruit patients from Amazon Prime membership. Um, <laughs> we, we, we've done many of those things in, in, in this trial and have, have seen those savings. So uh, hopefully there's a model there that we might be able to duplicate for other trials. And, um, and, and bring down the cost of development right at the outset. The precision medicine concept is something that's super important here. Yeah. And I think that's why some of these therapeutics are so expensive. So remember, to treat hypertension or blood pressure, I need to treat 1,000 patients to prevent four heart attacks, because I don't know which four of those patients are going to have a heart attack. But Spark knows exactly who needs their drug. And actually, all of these new therapies, whether they're CAR T, gene therapy, et cetera, know exactly the patients who need those drugs. So in some ways, you're actually saving the system money from that perspective. Because prior to precision therapy, I needed to treat 100 patients to figure out which 10 were going to respond to mine. Now, because I know the companion diagnostic, I know the specific biomarkers, I know exactly who will benefit. And then you throw on top of that, that like the fact, for example, Kim Raya, they, people only pay for a response. So now you'll only pay if you truly respond. Um, it's an 80% response rate, so that helps a lot with the market model. But I think that concept of precision medicine is really what transforms this field, and that's different than traditional drug development. And in some ways, that's why the cost is more expensive. But that's actually good for our patients, because we don't need those other 90 patients to get the drug. They're not going to benefit. They'll have side effects. They'll cost our system money. And they won't ultimately benefit from the so, drug. So Chris, if I can jump in on that. Uh, being a bit of a nerd, we actually ran those numbers. Oh, tell me. Right? Uh, do you tell. <laughs> so back when, back when, when statins were patent protected, yeah. they still only cost about $1,000 per patient per year. Sounds very cheap. But given the numbers that you just talked about, numbers needed to treat, we actually paid about $425,000 wow. to avoid one fatal event. Now, there were some other 
secondary events that were wow. avoided, avoid some. But we paid 420 some thousand dollars for this. So if we knew the one person who would respond, then we didn't have to treat the other yes. hundred through all this. Um, would you now pay me $400,000 up front once rather than $1,000 per patient for that many patients exactly. over multiple years? Mm -hmm. exactly. That's what precision medicine does. It completely disrupts these old rules of thumb because in the old days, we were just sort of renting it, right? You know, and you didn't know who was going to work. Well, now we're not going to rent the condo. We're going to buy the condo up front. And when we're going into the housing, we understand the difference between a rent payment and the mortgage principal amount, mm -hmm. right? And that's what cures are doing. They're changing this from a condo renting market into a buy the condo, right? And you have all the same kind of financing challenges with the exception that you don't know if the condo's actually gonna fall down after three or five years, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not durable. You don't know whether it's actually gonna work the way you wanted it to. Um, and a number of these other kinds of risks. So it's not exactly parallel, but it has some of those features Great statistic. to it. But to, play, to play off that metaphor though, you know, one of the new financing approaches that has been proposed by some um, is a consumer loan model. So, you know, almost a, a mortgage for your gene therapy. Um, and so I want to explore that topic a little bit and, and turn first to you, Lou. Is, it, is that appropriate for patients? Gosh, um, look, I, I think patients should absorb an appropriate um, a portion of the cost. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the question in my mind is um, making certain that the, the, the out-of-pocket burden for the patient is commensurate with the value they're receiving for the treatment. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can keep that in mind, then we can, we can, f we can find a cost that's appropriate for the patient. Mm -hmm. um, whether, and how you finance it, um, I'll leave that to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, but that is not the only model, Mark. I know at MIT you've had some other prototypical models. Yeah, so we've, we've looked at that, and actually our consortium of payers and patient advocacy groups actually gained alignment. You know, this is one where uh, the talk about an adult conversation, Lou, mm -hmm. but we had the adult conversation. <laughs> it was easier to do on financing than value setting, right? But in this adult conversation, the payers looked at the patients and said, in essence, for a million dollars, your deductible doesn't really make much difference. And the reason that we have it in the first place is to help you make the better choice of which therapies are appropriate for you. Well, with the kind of vetting you're going to have to go through anyway to get access to this, that question of whether this is appropriate doesn't apply. So all the uh, deductibles and copays, et cetera, don't really serve the purpose anymore. So they're actually talking about uh, getting rid of those as one of the options. The payers, mm -hmm. to their credit, were also the first group in the room to raise that the uh, idea from one of my colleagues at MIT that you should do these uh, patient financing models were inherently socially inequitable, uh, mm -hmm. that those who could afford it and have the good credit ratings would qualify, many on Medicaid and other sorts of places. Medicaid's a bad example because they don't have copays, but those who are just uh, in the exchanges, for example, uh, couldn't mm -hmm. afford these things. Um, and they didn't think they wanted to offer such products, right? <laughs> that the natural thing would be for them to offer the financing as well with, with the co-pays. And they said, we just aren't ethically comfortable with that. These were payers talking about social equity, right, mm -hmm. in this adult conversation. It was really quite encouraging, the kind of conversation about whether it applies in these senses and trying to keep the patient in the financial loop and not just in the, oh, it's good therapy for them, but you know, the money is separate. Payers also brought up the point that if you go to these performance-based annuities approaches, uh, there have to be protections for patients that it doesn't trigger a deductible every year yep. versus one deductible in the first year. That that again would be inherently unfair to the whole process. Again, payers bringing up these kind of issues in the context of these adult conversations. Really quite encouraging. Yeah, this is this has felt um, like a, a very rich discussion, but also a very U.S. focused discussion um, up until this point. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna look to Cindy if you can bring in some of the the international perspective um, on some particularly some of the collaboration occurring in this area. Yeah, certainly. So uh, I mentioned the geographic or regional distribution of the clinical trials. Um, last year there was an approval of a gene therapy um, actually in Korea, um, South Korea, 
was uh, one there. Um, about six um, gene therapy, cell therapies that um, have been approved in Europe and the regulations in the EMA um, is very consistent with that in the FDA, very rigorous um, requirements. Um, I, I think that the, the jury is still out in terms of mm -hmm. a HTA's uh, yes. perspectives um, yes. of how they're going to be managing. And um, whether their health authorities then abide by those HTA recommendations. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely, and in fact, you know, this is Don't a go topic. I, and, and I would just wrap up on my front, and, and certainly, Mark, you, you uh, fill in the fill in um, the, you're, the you're, details. You're doing it over there. We only analyze it, so <laughs> more valuable to hear from you. <laughs> yeah. So you know, that's really the quandary where you have the regulatory approval of the products of the gene or cell therapies, but yet will HTA uh, be reimbursing, or you know, even though Nice in the UK uh, will be, you know, uh, uh, providing some sort of recommendation. It's still up to the individual countries and, and it's very disparate uh, in terms of that reimbursability, uh, which makes, you know, further um, um, compression on the whole equation. So Europe and some of our US payers um, seem to have an attitude that they would really like to just pay for today's health status cheaper. <laughs> okay, and that actually paying for more health for their populations, they're really not interested in. I mean, I've been in sessions in Europe where I've been told orphan drugs are unethical, please stop making them and discovering them. Because every million I spend on some compassionate orphan drug use uh, is a million dollars I'm not spending on asthma where I can save ten times as many lives. Okay? These are real comments by pairs in Europe. I think it's a great failure of all of us to get our communities excited about the new kinds of cures and health value that we're delivering, and of course they're going to pay something for it. In all our uh, areas in the early 1900s, we paid huge amounts of money to put in sewer systems so we'd stop having all kinds of infectious disease and other sorts mm -hmm. of things we were excited. In the 1980s and 90s, we were excited to pay $420,000 to avoid a heart attack by paying 1000 a month for statins, right? We were excited about that. There were public health victories. Today, we're doing Star Wars medicine, to mm -hmm. use that term, and we're being criticized that spaceships might cost a little bit of money, <laughs> right? It was supposed to cost the same as the BMW. What's going on here? Well, why doesn't a mm -hmm. rocket to take me to Mars cost the same as a BMW? Uh, it's just craziness, and that's a, a failure, I think, of us collectively to imbue everyone else with the excitement that we see about this, and where better to spend a little more GDP than on health so we can enjoy all the other things that GDP is, is, uh, is, is giving us. And just one more uh, question to follow on before we do Q&A with the audience. Um, Chris, are, from an investor perspective, are, are you counting on returns from global markets? Do, do manufacturers need that to keep investing? Yeah, no, I mean, one of the issues for sure is that, in general, the U.S. market supports the entire mm -hmm. world market because pricing across worldwide is not always in a tight band and not all countries are willing to pay the same price in the U.S. So that is one fundamental problem with the, with, with in the system. I would say for rare and orphan diseases, absolutely, because there's just not enough patients in the U.S. to support the entire market for that drug. So for rare and orphan diseases, you'll see actually more, much, much more kind of burden placed on the ex-U.S. pricing. And there again, it's always about demonstrating the value to the patient and then helping the country to understand the economic burden and whether it's worth it for them. So it all comes back to, at the end of the day, what are you doing for the patients? Is it valuable to them? Is it valuable to them as a country? Because really, that's the kind of macro, large, you know, healthcare system decision that they're making. And is this more economic? And is this better than if I should spend, you know, spend the money somewhere else, where there may be other, again, very important health issues as well? So, all right, let's go to the, uh, the audience for uh, for some Q and A. So, um, this is a question really for Chris. You, you mentioned earlier about. Um, having to have a reasonable rate of return for investors. And I'm a little concerned about the cycle that that could potentially cause, meaning that as those rate of returns increase, the valuations of these companies go up, and therefore the cost to invest in them 
goes up, and then the rate of return that's required goes up. And does that cause a cyclical problem within the space that can be addressed in some way? And is there a way that, there, that this is being thought of in, in how to address that? I don't exactly understand your question, but just on the, I'll speak to the con kind of the rate of return for investors. So just a few things to remember. The rate of return is not just the cost that it took to develop this specific drug, because along the way, 32 other drugs died while I was working on that. And by the way, while I was trying to manufacture, I had four failures along the way too. So really, there's so much car cost to be absorbed in that average cost of taking that therapeutic to the clinic. And then, of course, what also drives the ROI is also what it costs to commercialize and get this product to our patients. And so from that perspective, it's if, it, if it's easier, if there's less burden, less negotiation, less back and forth, it's easier for me to get my patient, that's also cost. The other concept is I don't necessarily know if, if, if um, in, our, in general, in our economy and in a capitalist society, what a company deserves to earn is not necessarily based on the cost that it took them to get there. Because again, it's a competitive dynamic, right? So they won the game, and so one shouldn't be greedy about it, but at the same time, you know, we're not a cost plus system. You know, I'm not here to you know, make 10% off of what my cost in terms of my return on an IRR. So from that perspective, I think the thinking has to change a little bit. We're not a cost plus system. You know, the way to really drive down costs is to encourage competition to bring more players into the system. If we have three or four alternatives for every one of these cell therapies, I guarantee you the price is going to be a lot cheaper. If it's cheaper to distribute, if it's cheaper to manufacture, cheaper to get to our patients, mm -hmm. I guarantee you it's going to be a better game for all of us. So again, what we need to encourage, and here we are at the Milken Conference, is to encourage more development and free market forces in the biotechnology market. You can't regulate this and say you only deserve to make 10% on what you invested. What you need to bring in is more technology, more enthusiasm for people to get into the field. And just like Sovaldi, that price came down by 50%. And now our discussion is very, very different. Okay, over here. So delivery systems have been curing people for a long time. They fix a broken arm, they do a bone marrow transplant, they do a kidney transplant. These are durable changes to the patient and they get paid in various ways for their durable changes to the patient. So now we have some abstraction of service providers into that system that also want to get paid for improving those technologies, but sh how, what's changed in the payment model because we want to add a party? Joe, is that something you can address? Sure. So I, I, I think, um, and, and it's, a, it's a good point because we, we did look at organ transplantation and other things as another, again, model, right, where, where we have, um, you know, in essence, you know, cures or durable treatments through organ transplantation or, or other things. Um, you know, I think um, where, where, where we find ourselves is, you know, with um, the idea of kind of, you know, being able to take a, a, a gene approach to fixing an, what was un, uh, right now otherwise an incurable, um, a c incurable condition. Um, and so I think looking at that um, and, and thinking about that in the context of, again, making sure it's affordable to the system and, and organ transplantation and others had to think about the same thing about how they're going to be reimbursed for that. How does the hospital system get reimbursed? There are obviously a lot of ancillary costs that are associated with that. Um, so I think we are one, one component part of that, you know, and I think you need to look at all, all of the, those elements together. I think the, the one other thing I did want to, to bring up um, that we touched on earlier was kind of the regulatory pathway and the speed of development. I mean, I think if you look at other, um, other countries, and Japan is, is one existence where they have accelerated approval um, for certain types of, of therapies where based upon safety data, right, you're able to get a conditional approval and then demanstrate that you have an, eff a, a, an efficacy outcome um, on a, on a post-approval basis. I think being in the U.S., if we could think about for areas where we have established safety profiles, accelerating those pathways would reduce our development costs and would also reduce the overall you know, cost of, of drugs as well. So that was one point I did want to bring up that we didn't touch on earlier. What other questions? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you for the tremendous amount of interest on this topic. I'm Tanisha Carino. I'm the executive director of Faster Cures. 
I have a comment and a question, so I'll start with my comment. As much as I appreciate the Solvaldi example, I think it's really important to note that, just like Mark points out, the precision finance is really important here. We are probably not going to get a lot of competition in, mar in a market where you're going to have 30, 40, 100 patient lives when you get really precise. And I think that as a community, we have to understand that that's not, you're not going to have a small mo molecule market with rebates. You're not going to have six competitors come in to compete for 500 lives. And mm -hmm. that's something that we just have to grapple with. And, but the question I have is, if the system can spread payments, and I think that I really appreciate what Spark Therapeutics is doing to actually create a very different model of coming to market, how does that impact the valuations of the companies? So instead of it being 400,000 peak year sales in two years, you're talking about pulling that out 10, 15 years, ideally, for some payers. Um, and I guess that's the question for me, is, is does that market become less attractive where we have science that actually is ready for it because we fixed a payment problem? So, so I think one of the things that we look at, obviously, is where we want to build a sustainable company. So you know, we need to think about um, disease targets that are going to enable that. Um, and our, our first one was the one that was really driven by the science. And you're right, if, if we, and I think this is part of the problem and part of the, the policy fix that we need to find is to be able to encourage development in therapeutic areas where the patient populations are really small. And if it takes 15 years, you know, to develop, um, you know, a drug where there are only a thousand patients, we, we have to we have to do something on the incentive side to encourage companies to do that. You know, our 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 approved drug um, treats one very specific form of inherited blindness. There are over 250 genes that are known to cause various forms of inherited blindness, and it took us what 10, 15 years from the very beginnings of preclinical models through through development, right? It shouldn't take, you know, 15 years for each of those 250 um, genetic mutations to come up. And some of those, there may be only 50 patients. Those people deserve, you know, um, you know, a treatment as much as everybody else does. And I think we need to figure out the incentive models to enable that. Mm -hmm. By the way, I think we need to kind of parse out two different groups and we need to look at them in aggregate. So at the end of the day, 50 patients at any price is not going to bankrupt our system. But you know, Lou and I are more concerned about DLBCL and the treatment of CAR T and DLBCL, where there are how many patients? Mm -hmm. 40,000? At least. At least. That's a big ticket item. So that's a very different discussion than 50 patients at 400K. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking 40,000 patients at maybe 400. Right. So, and by the way, in DLBCL and CAR T, we're going to have three competitors. Hopefully, when the time as time goes on and these companies get approved. So, you know, we have to kind of parse out, you know, the number of patients in the indication, the modality. It's a really complex discussion, and mm -hmm. you know, from that perspective, we have to look at the total burden for that line item. I mean, what do you think about DLBCL and how we're going to get these, you know, CAR Ts to our patients there? Um, incurable disease currently. Um, Terrible, uh, aggressive it, lymphoma. It, 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 it's more in, really incidents aggressive. on the rise. Pa patients need new, new treatment options, and we have one now, um, and and it seems to be quite effective. So, look, the, the the issue is the issue that we've really been grappling with is how do we make a therapy like that generally accessible to all the patients that need yes. it? And, and yes, and it, it it could be ultimately forty thousand as that that kind of mod modality moves um, not as last line therapy, but all the way up to first line therapy. And, and, and on that note, um, I'm getting the sign in the back, we're about to get the cane on the, um, <laughs> on the, the panel here. Um, but I would, if I could pull up um, slide eight, take some liberty and use your slide, uh, Lou, and we can, we can contemplate uh, the patient again as, as, as we wrap up our conversation yeah. and a little bit of a lightning round. Uh, Colleen, um, I, I, mm -hmm. one of the things I think is important here, um, Emily has gone back to being a productive member of society. She was on her deathbed. She's gone back to being a productive member of, her, of the society. So I, I think there's a, it, it extends the complexity of the conversation mm -hmm. and, and the calculation even further. Oh, I think that's I think that's absolutely right, and 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 what I'd like to explore in you know probably yeah. 30 seconds or less per person is um, will these curative therapies bankrupt the U.S. healthcare system, and can we find a way to help patients uh, like Emily uh, re-enter and become productive members of, of society? So, Cindy. 
Jeff's lightning rod. Okay. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic. Um, in particular, um, the 21st Century Cures, Scott Gottlieb, uh, very, very supportive of finding innovative ways, uh, looking at different clinical and innovative clinical designs, and in particular, uh, the appetite of the agency to take real-world evidence in and helping, for instance, um, solving some of the long-term follow-up um, that these therapies are going to absolutely require. So very optimistic uh, on that front. Wonderful. Mark? Financing and risk shifting, or what a lot of you in this room do, are critical players that don't get talked about a lot in this. Mm -hmm. You have a great role to play in helping the society move through from classic therapeutics to these more curative therapies. Uh, so I'm really optimistic. There's phenomenal amounts of in innovation that's already being done on the financial side, and I think we can get through this tra transition. Uh, but if we don't change some government policies, a few other things, we're not going to get there. Uh, so there's risks, but I think the, the promise is so exciting. We'll find a way through. Yeah. I'm confident that it won't bankrupt the system. I think um, what we've seen early on is a real enthusiasm from kind of all the players, um, gene therapy and these cell therapies, and hopefully, you know, cures in the, in the small sense of the word are here to stay. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the type of therapy that we should be incentivizing um, and actually ridding, you know, patients of their, uh, of their disease rather than just treating it chronically. And I think we'll figure out a way to finance them. Lou, what's your thoughts? In, in, in 1953, there were 120,000 cases of polio in the United mm -hmm. States. In 1963, there were zero. So you all know what happened to get us there. If you think about the, comp we're, we're talking about complex um, products and development today and how to pay for them, I would posit to you that back then, the creation of the polio vaccine was just as complicated and we were mm -hmm. worried about some of the same issues. We managed it before, we'll manage it again. My last point is really when we make investments, at the end of the day, we like to think about is this drug going to be meaningful and valuable to the patient? Is it going to transform the patient's life? And that's why we have the picture up here. Because at the end of the day, if we create drugs that are going to transform patients' lives, it's not a question of if we need it. It's only a question of how are we going to do this together? How are we going to make sure that these therapies can get to patients? How are we going to make sure we finance it? And we're all in it together. So from that perspective, let's keep our hurdles high. In, in this field. Well, thank you very much for being here today. I'm uh, grateful to the audience for the great questions in the panel, and I'm sure this is a conversation that uh, we'll be having for many more years uh, to come. So thanks for joining us today. Mm -hmm.